that's not to talk about um, the of the um, You talked about um, complex structured visual models. Do you envisage those as being two-dimensional images or three-dimensional models from which you then try and match possible um, um, uh, transformations of those models to match the images? Yeah, both. Basically, I mean, in, I showed an example for an image, but in the long run, we want to go to videos, obviously. So I'm more interested. I'm more working on videos today, right? I'm more interested in videos because that's much more complex. And so what you want to do there is to align, for example. You did some work on aligning videos. Yeah, it so wasn't so much the moving versus still images. It was the using, facing recognition on possible transformations of three-dimensional models and indeed three-dimensional models interposed between each other and so forth. In other words, trying to construct theories or hypotheses about how the, the model, the existence of the models and how they are arranged and match those against images rather than matching just images against images. You see what I mean? No. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, so I think a lot of what, well, if I, I may have misunderstood, but a lot of what I, I understood to have seen today was about matching two-dimensional images Methods of matching two-dimensional images. What often happens in our, what I, yes. I believe happens in our brains, is that we have three-dimensional theories of the world, even though we only see sort of two and a bit dimensions. And when we're recognising a, a, a scene that we see, okay, so we form a hypothesis okay, so based on on the internal models of the things yeah, that yeah. we think we might see, and then we we okay. read out those hypotheses to make sense of the actual set of things that we're seeing. Do, yes. do you see what I mean? Yeah. So what you're meaning is actually. Do we want, how do you want to represent 3D objects, right? So what we're doing now, what I showed you, represent it as a collection of images. And what you want to do is link this connection together with this very, this like manifold, right? To have some kind of space of 3D objects which you then match to the images, right? Yeah. And so I think it's, I would say it's an open question, right? So people have tried to model the 3D information and match that back to the images. But again, creating these 3D models is still an open problem, right? So basically, there is work, I mean, I can point you to some work where people have actually reconstructed the objects in 3D and then they match that to the image as a recognition approach, right? And the problem here is that getting these 3D models is still very complex. There's also work people use type models, for example, match those to depth data. And these things do exist. And yes, I agree, you have to think, I agree, you have to think about how to represent this 3D information. The one hope from these videos is actually that once you have the variability within a video, you can do that together to get a 3D, like 3D, 2D and a half model. Because probably you don't want a full 3D model, right? That's probably not what you have in the brain either. It's too complex. What you really want is kind of a structure of how the object can evolve over time, right? And if you have a different viewpoints of a video, then you can create that automatically. So obviously, you don't want to go and set an object on the turntable and turn the camera on. So it's much too complex, because then you want to model many objects, it gets very complex. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the genius in designing a good optical recognition system wasn't cleverly designing the features and matching or indexing stages. Now it seems that you just throw some data at a deep neural network, and even if you hand tune the parameters or the layout parameters, you, it seems that just throwing data and waiting for the result, if you have something clever, um, then you wait less. If you don't know anything, then you wait more. But essentially, just throwing data and then waiting for the answer, um, that seems um, a bit strange. So um, what are your views on combining the research from, say, 20 years ago into this new model? What if we have the ability to learn models over large data sets? Well, well, first of all, these models, to learn them, you have to have very precise training data, right? So basically, these models, they work well for individual objects, for example, right? So you have to have an idea where the objects are. So there, which I showed is actually you have to have these regions, these, these constructed regions, which you actually use to apply these features, for example. So that would be a way of combining those features. Also, all the approaches for matching, they still hold. So if you want to recognize a particular objects, you, use, you still use the techniques which have been developed 10 years ago. And I think all these weekly supervised approaches for me I guess some of these new features, you can use them and you can also update them, but it's not clear how you completely learn completely unsupervisedly, right? There are some attempts to model, to learn it with a cost function with these deep neural networks, but then basically you're simulating very similar cost functions, right? 
is that then it's very it's very close. The two approaches are very close. In one case, you're just optimizing very complex network and searching what's learned there. The other way, you're just determining more automatically what's learned. So I, I guess the the question is still open: how much you use from both sides? But I think if we could use our um, knowledge of, say, the CIFDIS scripter as an initialization for the learning system, then that would be great because we know that CIFDIS scripter just works for matching images in relatively limited scenarios. So there's no need for the neural network to learn that from scratch. No, and also I think the strength of the neural network is not to learn local descriptors, right? Well, the strength is to learn the combinations of descriptors and the hierarchy. And something which is not clear what the different, what role plays the different layers, right? So if the first set of layers, which are all convolutions, and then you have the fully connected layers. And so it's actually not clear what's, so far for me, it's not clear what's the impact of which layer. And once you know that, then you can probably much better understand how to combine the different types of approaches. That's a really great talk. Um, so I think there's been incredible progress in computer vision, but it seems to me that it hasn't had all that much impact all that much obvious impact on our everyday lives. So things like face recognition door locks, they're, they're not commonplace by any means. And I, I just wonder how much you think that's going to change over the next 10 years. What's not commonplace, you said? Uh, so, I mean, for example, when I go to my house, I've got to use my key to unlock the door. Well, but why doesn't the door just recognize me and say, hi, Simon, come on in? So things like this, uh, you, you can't get a robot, vacu uh, a robot uh, garden weeder. Whereas the techniques, they, they seem to me very, very nearly ready to do exactly those sort of things. So, so my question is really, how much do you think these sort of computer vision methods will impact our everyday lives over the next 10 years? Over the next 10 years? I mean, I think the thing that you can open your door, I mean, that's just to get risk of money, right? I mean, if you want to pay 1,000 euros, I think you can, I don't know. It exists, but you can probably install the ticket on your house. Would be really it's, so, so is it, it's just it's not everyday thing, is it? Yeah, I would say there's for some things there's a startup cost, and for some things you can still not do it. So my, my favorite example is this robot which fills up my dishwasher, and that's something we're not yet there yet, right? I think <laughs> <laughs> we have made a lot of progress towards it, but we're not there yet, and I think it will come eventually. Okay. Um, I hope it will come eventually. It will come eventually, but there are things like a door or like in identifying basically on your smartphone, you can be identified as a user, right? That exists. Mm -hmm. so I think for your door, it's just that I mean, you have to have the electronics, you have the door open, blah, 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 but that's it's just a cost, right? So there's this cost, the startup cost, and then there are things which are still not 100% sure. But many things also people are that don't like it. So if you go to your house and you say, hi, it's me, and the, the thing doesn't recognize you, then it's really off for me. So these are things also which have been holding back, big back the progress, right? So for some things, like for car safety, I mean, the rational is, if it, if you don't do an accident, and that's, that's things which are coming, right? So again, it's a cost thing. So I talked to some car manufacturers recently, and it's actually the higher level cars, the higher level very expensive cars, they have all the security system on board, and all the cheap cars that don't have it. So there's this cost factor, right? But that's just, question of time. By the time it gets cheap enough, it will be on the uh, other you, you had a section in your, uh, a slide in your last section about recognizing whole features, uh, whole scenes at once, or recognizing multiple features simultaneously of, of a scene. Um, can you just speak a, a, a bit about the techniques there? Is there just a, a, a trained Bayesian network on the, the various single classifiers involved, or is it something more subtle? You mean the slide in the in the end, the future work slide, or yeah, with the with the motorbike and the well, that's the, that's not that's not automatic. That's just future work. So that's what we would like to get, right? So that's there's no technique to ever. It's manual. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's what we would want, like in five years or ten years. That's what we would want to be. And so about the techniques, yeah, I have a lot of ideas which techniques to use. For example, segmentic segmentation, and then combine the features with some kind of graphical model. So there are techniques around. But this was just, I mean, did you see? I mean, it recognizes the car, the name of the guy, and everything. So it's really like a lot of information. <laughs> uh, I've been working with a guy who um, you may know. Uh, I better not mention his name because all the stuff he does is a bit uh, under uh, the radar. But there is definite uh, applications uh, for, for what you're doing. Um, we're seeing them in the, in the industrial space. And uh, whilst it's not happening, uh, I, I agree, it, it, for the public, it's definitely happening in businesses. And uh, they're using the technology you described and um, very successfully. 
I am very much a layman here, but I am interested in Charles Bonnet syndrome, which we've probably heard of, I think, which is where people have hallucinations. And the idea, of course, is to try and find out the me uh, methods in the brain in which these hallucinations can occur. Is there any way whereby your uh, discoveries can be moved across into, moved across into neurology and that sort of thing? I'm also thinking of Alzheimer's as well, by the way, which again is another possibility, isn't it? Well, the brain literally does do very peculiar things, and you may one day, from your discoveries, help us. Difficult question. So, would you want to analyze the brain? I mean, so there are methods which analyze actually the. Rather to imitate the brain, you know, take an imitation of it to using high technology and see is it working quite the same as what you're doing now? So, I believe, for example, at Manchester, there's a, a, a man there who's uh, trying to sort of imitate Alzheimer's using a very powerful computer which may be slightly in the direction of what you're going, except the two would come together. Hmm. I guess in the long run they could, they could come together, but for, for now, so I, I do talk to people who analyze the brain, right? So there's actually some people who apply computer vision techniques to this hmm. fMRI and infra, uh, MRI images, right? Because there you can really see, for example, if you show objects, you can see things which light, light, light up in the brain and then you can match Mm -hmm. and learn the relations of people and people do that and what's what the similar techniques which are there are the machine learning techniques right so you can relate actually different regions of the brain to different inputs and mm -hmm. go back and forth so that's things which are going on and of course that doesn't really explain how the brain works right no but the idea of course is that you try and imitate the brain the two ideas that work together you may end up like solving problem or not you know? well i guess the thing which is a, people don't know, I mean, there are two problems, right? People don't know how the brain works. I mean, it's kind of an open problem. And B, it's not, for me, I mean, maybe more fundamental, it's not clear that the machine and the brain need to work in exactly the same way, right? Because there are things at which the machine is much better. So, I mean, today there are things which the computer can do much better, right? If you have this million of images, but you can just search through, I mean, you as a human, you cannot memorize a million images. Or, or for face recognition, I mean, that's one of the things which people don't like because you can just store a million mm -hmm. of faces and then just run through them and you know who the guy is, which again, he cannot do, right? So it's, it's probably not exactly the same way of functioning, right? It's not the same, same level. And the human, on the other hand, is much better at all the cognitive processes, right? I and mean, even a, a newborn can probably do some tasks better than a computer, which is kind of sad, right? <laughs> So anyway, it's, it's an interesting question, yes, and people do look, I mean, they do look at these problems, but for now, it's not clear how to use the insights from brain and creation for us. Yes, well, thank you very much, Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, if uh, or something or compressive sensing has been used in computer vision, if it has been effective. Sparse something, sparse, sparse um, reconstruction. And compressive sensing in terms of uh, some signal if you, if you know what you are looking for or if you know yeah it has been used a lot in image reconstruction and deep blurring and things like that and does it compromise the effectiveness of vision well, it depends how you do it right but there's approaches to compressive sensing which can be used directly to compress your features for example there's a lot of I mean, so I'm familiar with the work in sparse coding and people have been using sparse coding for example to represent their feature vectors, right? So you can just map your feature in the high dimensional space using sparse coding, for example. So that's the work which I would refer to. I don't know if exactly that's what you're thinking of. But the application could be like a, a camera that would uh, look for a specific object and would be simpler and uh, low power some sort. Mm, yeah, I mean, I mean the si signal processing to kind of represent the signal differently. So yeah, yes, people are using that, but it's more people who are working really on the signal level, right? To improve the signal. And then I guess if the signal is improved, for example, the blurring, okay, if you have blurring video, it completely hampers your performance. So if you can do, if you have good approaches for deep blurring, then yes, you can feed it as an input to this kind of approaches here. It's a fascinating subject, and I know the questions <coughs> would go on, but we probably need to draw to a close. I'd like to uh, welcome Professor Karen Shankland, 
uh, from uh, Stirling University, also chair of BCS Women in Computing Research Committee, to give a vote of thanks and, and close proceedings for us. Thank you, Derek. So, Cam Spark Jones famously said that computing is too important to be left to men. <laughs> and now, okay, well, on the face of it, that could be quite an offensive statement. Um, but I think it's about diversity. And um, I think one of the nice things that's shown in this room, actually, is that um, if we want to do good computing, we have to have a lot of different kinds of people involved um, in that. The other thing about diversity is that one of the reasons that we have this Karen Spark Jones lecture is to showcase some of the brilliant women that we have in computing research. So I think um, Cordelia did a fantastic job tonight. So we chose her because she's a formidable researcher, right? And it was mentioned at the beginning how many uh, awards that she's won and all the great things that she's done. Um, uh, one fact that blew me away was I looked at her CV and she's had more than 39,000 citations on her papers. Now either she's got lots of papers, which she probably has, but some of those papers have a huge number of citations that, to be honest, I can't even really dream about. Right? So 39,000 citations, that's amazing. Um, but I think tonight she's given us a really brilliant talk. She um, guided us through um, the history of computer vision. Um, I learned a lot because I didn't know about computer vision before tonight. Um, and she told us about all the exciting things that are happening um, in her own lab, but also in other labs. I think she did that in a really accessible way. So we also want our role models not just to be brilliant researchers, but to be able to talk to other people as well. Um, so I'd like uh, you to join me in uh, thanking Cordelia again for a really excellent talk. Thank you for that. Can I close by thanking you all for coming and I hope you've enjoyed the evening. Thank you. Thank you.